Yeah, it is working. Can you hear me? Uh, okay, hello, welcome everybody to our Agile Auckland meetup. Today, our topic is the product owner, the, the last role that we will be discussing in our series of uh, Agile roles. Uh, our speaker is Anthony. Anthony had over four years of experience working as a product owner. He started at Pfizer, uh, then he moved to the Orion Health, as you can see on the T-shirt. And uh, I would like to thank, say thanks to our sponsors, Assurity Consulting, ASB Bank, and Halo Consultings. Th thanks to them, we can have those meetups on quite good quality. We can record videos and have some uh, food after. So speaking about that, I uh, welcome all of you to stay a little bit, have a chat with us. Uh, there will be time for having questions to, to our speakers and just spend a little bit of time with us uh, with uh, some food that will be provided after the, uh, the talk. So about things like restrooms, uh, to get to the closest rest restroom, if you will leave our room, turn left and go straight, there will be uh, the restroom. Next to the restroom is uh, also, f also, also a fire exit. So the, the, the main uh, and the main uh, doors uh, is the closest fire exit. For the Q&A session, we are using Slido. Uh, Slido is an application that you can just go to the www.slido.do and then uh, our room is hashtag agile. If you'll join there, you can just ask questions during the presentation. At the end, we'll go through those questions and together with Anthony, uh, we'll be trying to answer those. Uh, so, yeah, that's it. Anthony? All right. Thank you. Let me just reset that timer. All right, so the product owner. What is this mythical beast? So the title of the talk was sort of inspired by um, last month's meetup where um, Aang talked about um, product owners and he said, you know, he, he's never met a, a dedicated product owner. He, he was wondering what this mythical beast actually was. And I thought, well, that's a, a really good thing to talk about, so that's why I'm here today. Um, so my name's Anthony Marta, at NCM if you're, if you're doing tweeting type stuff. Uh, if you look for me on LinkedIn, I'm pretty much the only Anthony Marta in New Zealand, so I'm not, not that hard to find. So who am I and where am I coming from? Um, so my experience has been product ownership at scale. I am a dedicated product owner. I, I don't share this role with any other roles. Um, I became a product owner when I um, was at working at Fiserv New Zealand. They do mobile banking apps based down near Britomart. Um, I actually started there as a project manager. So I've done project management into product ownership, which is a relatively unusual track. Most of you tend to be BAs. Um, and there I started with one team and that scaled up to sort of six teams and uh, my role at Orion Health now, I'm a uh, sort of senior product owner there, um, I'm looking across a cross-organisation release train. So it's a sort of product ownership kind of at scale, so I'm used to doing things at, at, at kind of big scale. Um, I've primarily been working in product companies, so we're building products as, as opposed to services, just to make that distinction. Um, the products I've been working on have been large and monolithic, not necessarily by choice. I'd really love them to be microservices, but, you know, um, can't, can't have everything. Um, and multiple teams working on a single release. So it's been product ownership across a large-scale um, organization. So the basics of the role. And um, so I, I was, when I sort of put the title of my talk, I sort of polled around my office to sort of say, well, what kind of mythical beast um, are product owners? And, Somebody said, we're, we're a hydra, you know, we have, we've got multiple heads, we have to be everywhere all the time, you can't stop us. Um, but I said it on a dragon because it was prettier. So, the very basics, so real simple stuff, what do I do? I create a backlog, I prioritise a backlog, I work with our teams to deliver that backlog, and then I go have a coffee. Simple, right? Even anyone can be a product owner. Well, that's kind of actually why I'm here, because one of the things um, I want to focus on is um, we don't talk much about the role of the product owner in, this, in Agile. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about how good Agile teams behave, how to be a good scrum master. There's a lot of discourse around that. There's a lot of talk about how developers and QA should work in an Agile team. And then it's like, oh, hey, we need a product owner. Let's go grab this guy from the business somewhere or we'll grab this team lead or something like that. And hopefully when you leave tonight, I'll leave you with the impression that actually this is a role that's a lot bigger than that, and we need to be talking more about this in the industry, in New Zealand, and just generally. Um, 
so why do I why do I actually care about all this stuff? Why am I actually here as a product owner? I'm a business guy. Um, why do I really care about this whole agile thing at all? Um, and, and that's kind of why. And I'll break that down. So my vision for our organisation is that we will regularly ship product, which in my case is software, that meets the needs of our users. Very simple. I don't actually care about agile. I don't actually care about uh, DevOps and all you know continuous integration and all that kind of thing. And what I care about is that. I'm, I want to ship to my users. Um, I'm a bit lazy, you know, I can't really, I, I try to kind of predict the future, but I can't really predict the future, and so I want to ship stuff kind of, you know, regularly so that I can be, so I can change and be a bit flexible. So that's what I care about. So I want to regularly ship product, because we live in a world of uncertain, of uncertainty, of unknown unknowns. There's always a new client, there's always a new requirement coming along. We have to be able to adjust and adapt. We need software that meets the needs of our users. We need to ship only what they need, only what actually solves their business problem, not features, and I'll come to that in a minute, and also not their imagined needs. You know, I, we've got this really, really, really expensive development time. Somebody said that the only, um, the only thing in the world that's more valuable than gold is developer time. It's just, you know, it's the probably rarest thing. It's rarest than whatever the most rarest element in the universe is. And it's, so it's really expensive and really hard to use, and we have to use it effectively. And so we've got to be using that to create value. What's value? Um, so if you've been around um, agile or product ownership, you've probably seen this, um, this graphic here. So I've got, a, I've got a, a client that wants something. They want a car. They come to me and say, hey, um, Anthony, I want you to build me a car. I'm like, cool, OK. Um, so in the old world, I'll go, OK, well, let's start with a wheel, and let's grab another wheel, and we'll put a chassis in there, and some body, and a car. And, you know, only till that last stage of the client goes, well, hey, you've given me a car. Um, but actually, I'm not sure that I needed, really needed a car. What if we started with that second approach there? So um, they say, I want a car. And I go, well, how about a skateboard? And they'd be like, yeah, OK. You know, maybe a skateboard might be useful to me. I'm, I'm actually just trying to get from A to B. Oh, you're trying to get from A to B. That's your business problem. That's what you value. You value the ability to get from A to B. I can give you a skateboard. It's a bit manual. It doesn't quite get you to A to B as fast as... Um, you want to, but it gets you there. And then I'll build you a scooter and then a bicycle and a motorcycle and then you'll get your car. But you know, when I get to the bicycle stage, I actually find that you only had to go a few kilometers and the bicycle's actually all you need. So my development team, this, this really, really expensive rare resource can stop at the bicycle stage and not carry on. I can realize value faster. Um, so that's a great example, but how does this really work in the real world? So an example I came across when I was working at Fiserv um, was that uh, we were building this thing where we needed to take a mobile app binary and take some branding, munge these two things together and produce a package that we ship. And we did, had different branding for different clients and it was all sort of we're creating this whole automated thing. And it's like, okay, that's cool. And like, we'd done some high level estimation and we thought it was about, you know, the initial stage of it was about two or three weeks worth of work, like sprint, sprint, sprint in a bit kind of thing. And um, so I said to the team, so okay, so as a, as a product owner, I'm the business guy, and you know, I don't really care how people go about it, and so I want to stay completely out of the how and um, working with them. So okay, so I'll give you, give you guys some, some, some sort of vision about what we're trying to achieve. You know, we, need, we want to build these binaries. Um, We've got this control center administrator user interface. I want somebody to be able to go in there and I want them to be able to you know, click through and select the branding that they want and select the binary they want to apply it to and press go and hey presto, away it will go. And I'm, I sort of walked away from that, that discussion kind of happy that I hadn't strayed into the how at all, being, being a good business guy and staying away from the technical details. Um, and team, oh, okay, cool, yep. So they come back to me um, a couple of days later and said, hey Anthony, you know that's actually going to be about, uh, I think it was about three or four sprints worth of work. And I went, crap, that's, that doesn't look good in my schedule. You know, I've got this, this thing that I'm trying to ship, you know, suddenly I've gone from a sprint, what I thought was going to be about a sprint and a half to sort of four sprints worth of work. Ugh, that's not cool. Um, and the Scrum Master sort of sensed my kind of inward and a little bit outward panic and, and uh, he says to me, hey, um, how about I go back to the team and see if they can find another way of, of doing that? And um, I went, cool. Um, yep, let's you know, ha certainly have a go. I'll, I'll welcome any suggestions at this point because I'm sort of panicking a bit. And uh, so they go away and they come back to me the next day and said, well, 
what about if rather than going through the user interface, we just, um, you just drop your branding package into a directory, there'll be this file watcher thing in there, it'll pick up the binary, apply it, and spit it out the other side. You know, no user interface, but you'll get your branded binary. And I went, ah, oh, my business problem was getting branded binaries, not you know, going through user interface and clicking and all that kind of stuff. My business problem was that. And I said, well, okay, it's not quite what I wanted, but that actually solves my needs. And so that's a great example of how business problems are so very important. So what do I actually do as a product owner? Um, so we've got to ship some stuff. So in that example, we needed to ship this capability that allowed us to generate these binaries. And we want to build something that allows somebody to get transport. Um, I am part of that team. So, so lesson number one about the product owner is that you're part of the team. You're not the team's boss, you're not the team's manager, um, you're not the business guy. You're part of this group of people who are trying to solve a business problem. Um, my sort of expertise though is at the why. My team is super good at the how. They're really massively smart people, way, way, way smarter than I am. And, but I'm hopefully maybe a little bit smart at the why, maybe, I don't know. And so I try and work with them to get down to the how, and they work on the how and come back to me with, uh, okay, well, does that satisfy your why? We're collectively trying to solve a business problem. So what does a successful, t what does team success look like? So I want to try and move from a world where I'm just saying to the team, build this feature, build this thing, you know, build me this, this build branding binary thing through using a user interface to solve this problem. Because in the world of build this feature, requirements become a big thing. You know, we have to specify out every single last detail because we're telling the team what they need to do. Um, upfront design, no change allowed. You know, we might come out the other side. It takes, always takes longer than we expect. It's my, my estimate that blew out there. And our client, when it gets to them, may or may not actually do what they want. I want to move to a world where, we're, where our teams are solving that problem. We're doing that collectively. No longer am I going, build this. I want them to help me solve this problem. And when they're solving this problem, the team is, is finding the solution. They're empowered. They can innovate. And we can validate on that solution and then iterate. Um, and this is the world that we're kind of moving to with, with Agile. You know, we're trying to inspect and adapt. We're trying to ship regularly. We're trying to solve these business problems. Um, I also mentioned the word churn there because often when we talk about just features, if the business suddenly changes their mind about the, the, the thing that they're trying to do, then it feels to the developers like, oh, no, we were building this feature, now we've got to build that feature, and oh, now our business has changed their mind, now we've got to build this thing again, and, and then build something else. Business problems tend to vary a bit less. You know, they're a bit sort of higher level. Um, is it better? Well, I, I always hesitate to say that Agile is better than anything else, um, but in my opinion, it is. <laughs> so what does a successful team look like to me? How, how, you know, what is my part, what part do I play in this? So, a successful team is that the team can understand the business problem, self-organize around solving it, and recognize when it's solved. That, that is the essence of a successful team, be it Agile, be it any other team. And so my role as a product owner is to try and help make that happen. Easy, right? Simple. Fortunately not, I wish. So firstly, are we actually solving a business problem? So we've come from a world of features. We've come from this world of, you know, we want this feature and that feature. Um, particularly, it's evident in my organization where we start off this conversation, we need to solve, oh my God, shiny tech stuff. Uh, no, no, shiny tech stuff. No, does that really solve a business problem? Maybe, maybe not. Also, I mentioned before that business problems tend to change less over time, so the team feels a bit better. If you're spending a lot of time in your organization saying, okay, let, guys, let's move this upper level, then you're probably not yet solving the business problem. Um, I've got a little, little map, a little impact map over there, so Goico Agic, impact mapping, fantastic way of trying to tease out business problems from away from features. And okay, now we've identified which business problems, what our business problems are, but which ones do we actually start with? So there's lots. So architecture, market and features, quality, tech debt, team happiness, support, delivery engineering, innovation, the list goes on. All these different stakeholders in the organization. Ultimately, we've got to ship an increment of product that has something, but how do we make a choice? We've also got to balance short-term rewards with long-term velocity as well. So, and this will happen in any organization that um, our, uh, one of our tech leads will take me aside and go, okay, um, look, we've got to do something about this tech debt, Anthony. You know, this is really, really, really important. 
we've got to do it, um, you know, we've got to sort this stuff out, it's going to ruin us, and I'm going, okay, cool, yep, great. And they'll walk away from me convinced that I will have you know, heard them and prioritized that really highly. And then about five minutes later, somebody from UX will come and have exactly the same conversation. So as a product owner, I have to try and sit in the middle of that, try and mediate all those people, um, sometimes some are easier than others, and try and come up with, uh, this is the next thing that we're going to prioritize in our backlog. It's fun, it takes a lot of negotiation skills, um, it takes a lot of trying to hold people back, it takes a lot of saying, hey, you're not as special as you think you are, uh, which is not often an easy conversation to have, um, but that's kind of what we're, what we're paid to do. And so we've got to try and we, we have to come up with some consistent way of communicating value. So um, I did a talk on product ownership uh, last year, and one of the kind of the hardest questions I had to answer is, how do you define value? You know, tell, tell me how you define value. What, what, what number, what metric, what formula do you use to define value? And I, so I had to say, well, actually, really, I don't have a single way of doing it, because value varies over time. Value varies with environment, with client demands, market demands, the state of your tech. Um, you know, some explosion that happened with a client yesterday that, you, that you're still dealing with. So in my opinion, at least, it can't be consistently quantified. You, know, you can't have a consistent formula for value. It can, however, be agreed on. You can get consensus at a given moment in time, generally, that this is the thing that we should do. It might just be that that might change tomorrow. And one of the techniques I've seen employed for that is the idea of sliders. You have like a card with some sort of sliders on it, and you just to say, well, you know, particularly if you're dealing with some difficult stakeholders, okay, which of these things should we prioritize? We've got all these different factors, gain agreement around those factors, and that gives you value that, can, that you can get, move forward with. Then, okay, so we've defined our business problems. We've kind of tried to do some prioritization, um, and that's in building, elaborating, and prioritizing the backlog. So there's some, some photos from uh, within Orion. Um, one on the top left is a um, affinity sizing um, exercise we went through. We were trying to figure out how big some of the work was in our backlog. We had a very unsized backlog. Um, it was very hard for us to prioritize because we didn't know how big things were, what our ROI was. So we went through that. Um, and then some examples of us making our backlog um, transparent. So um, one of the key things, one of, one of the sort of unexpected things I found about the role of the product owner is I underestimated the value of making your backlog transparent. Because what I found is that you'll get a stakeholder who will come to you and go, hey, I've got this really, really super important thing. We've got this new client come in. They're really important to us. Let's do this. And you could, if you don't have a transparent backlog, you'll go, oh, OK, cool. Well, yeah, yeah I'll, we'll look at that, and we'll, you know, we'll come back to you. And they'll walk away sort of convinced that you're going to do it. And they've probably already sold it. Um, if you've got a visible backlog, you can go take, take that thing, take them to the backlog, and go, Okay, what would, you like, what would you like to not have to do that? Or would you like to give me some more teams so that I can deliver it? Backlog transparency is super, super, super important. It makes those conversations much easier. Communicating vision. So we've got this backlog all sized up, and the team are actually going to start working on it. Um, but we need to, it's coming back to my introduction, was that we need to introduce the team to the vision for the thing, the business problem, and stay out of that how. But we're having a conversation with a technical team. So I've got developers, I've got testers, I've got business analysts. Um, I personally come from a technical background, but no, you know, I don't know very much about the tech that we use at all. I kind of know how it works at a black box level. No idea about the technical detail. I have to have a conversation with them in a way that gets them to buy into my vision. And so it's another key aspect of the product owner role is you're that translator between the business side. So I have to explain to them why this thing for this client that we're building um, up in New York is so important, but explain it to them in a language that makes sense to your average developer. And so we have to get used to kind of translating between those two worlds. Um, various techniques for that, specification by example is a great one because it gets people examples of you know, how they, that thing's actually going to be used, gets them motivated around that, um, workshops. Big rule, never assume anything when you're dealing with a team just because they're nodding their heads and they say that they understand your vision doesn't make sh actually mean that they are. It's one of my, my big personal takeaways. And decision making. So our teams now, I've explained the vision to them, they're away in building, and then they come across some kind of technical challenge. And it's like, okay, well, we need to, we've got different options here. Um, 
Ideally, the team would be able to validate this with an actual customer, so we go different options, they'd take it to a customer, the customer would go, okay, we want to do this. But in the real world, particularly um, when we're building out of New Zealand, for, so for a company like Orion, our clients are global, Fiserv was the same thing, we were primarily shipping up to the US. There's nobody in the office at four o'clock in the afternoon who they can go to immediately who's a customer to validate it. So that's kind of me as the product owner. I need to be able to make a decision. and. There's a phrase out there that the, the role of the product owner is to be the single ringable neck. You know, you're on the hook. Uh, that's not about being blaming or scapegoating. That's no, a terrible mental image. It's about velocity. You need to be able to keep that team moving. Ultimately, there needs to be somebody who can go, at the end of the day, right, this is the decision, let's move on, rather than endlessly arguing around the different options. Um, I had once had somebody come to me and say, um, okay, well, how do, what's, what, are your, what are your rules around prioritizing and deciding whether we should do it this way or that way? And I had to say to them, well, there's the reason why the product owner is a person and not a rule book or maybe a dragon, is that I think the world, you know, the, the environment changes, factors change every day, and so we've got to try and get enough experience to be able to make those decisions. So it's, it's often why a product owner will be somebody who's been around the blocks a bit, you know, been a business analyst, or in my case, a project manager and a developer, been a developer tech lead, something like that. You need to have some reasonable familiarity with how to make decisions, how to trade off factors. Oh, and then done, done, done. It's not done until it's done, done, done. This is uh, the thing we, we had we had to uh, ship it. What was it, ship it in November? I can't remember, Cleo, I can't remember if you, yes. So, yeah, something like that. Anyway, a big focus on actually shipping the products out the door because the technical team can finish, build it, put it on the shelf, at least it's actually used by a customer, no value at all. And so a lot of organizations, um, actually, no, sorry, I'll use a different example there. So um, a group of our team when I was at Fisev went to Agile New Zealand, I think 2014, the conference down there where Goico did a course before the, um, before the, the main event. And, um, he asked one of our one of our team, okay, so um, what, what's your iteration length? And they said, oh, we do two-week sprints. Okay, yeah, but how often do your customers actually get the software from that? Mm, about every nine months. Great, your sprint length is nine months. Uh, Ryan, we're a bit better than that. We're, we're shipping on one-month intervals. <laughs> but it doesn't matter until it's in the hands of the customer. You can get that validation back to determine if you've solved their business problem. And so a key part of the product owner is advocating for this. Another aspect here is that sometimes, as a product owner, I'm the only one in my organization, um, who, or my delivery organization, who's actually 100% aligned with the client. You know, sometimes you'll have teams that might be split up into, say, different components. Um, my client doesn't actually care about these individual components. What they care about is when everything comes together and actually gets shipped to them. And so if, as a product owner, you're feeling like um, you know, you're the only one looking out for the, the needs of your client, probably means your organization is a wee bit broken in terms of alignment with the actual client. You're actually not getting to that done, done, done you, as, a, as a group. So we have to do all of that stuff. So how, how big is the role? We, you know, when do you actually need this mythical beast called a dedicated product owner? Um, so the general industry rule seems to be about one product, one dedicated product owner per two um, scrum teams. So each scrum team is, um, say, six to nine developers, somewhere in that kind of range. Oh, sorry, six to nine developers, testers, and business analysts six, six, as, as a unit. Um, what if you have more than that? So there's various models around scaling the product owner role. Um, at uh, Spotify, they, they call, um, a, a, so there's like an overarching role called a chief product owner. At Fiserv, we called them software product managers. That was my role. I'm a solution product owner at Orion Health. Um, and then I've got a bunch of teams, each who have a product owner with a ratio of about one to two teams. Um, if you have less than this, your product owners are going to be super busy or perhaps not terribly effective. I think that was a challenge to all of you because um, one thing that came through in, in Ayang's talk was that a lot of organizations still have somebody who's a part-time product owner, even with a relatively large number of teams. If you're doing that, you're probably not going to be as, as effective as you could be. So you do need this mythical beast. Do you actually need a dedicated product owner? Um, so kind of where the role has come from has been this kind of nexus of the role of the product manager, who's often the subject matter expert, the business guy, and the business analyst who's part of the team. And in the past, there hasn't been this role called a product owner. The role has sort of been done by one of those two people generally. But 
the challenges are that the product manager, they're often deep into the market, uh, so deep in, they're deeply involved in the market. Sometimes they're not co-located with the team. When I was at Fiserv, all of the product managers were located up in the US. Um, and so they're not sitting with the team. And as your, the product that you're working with gets more and more complicated, your business analysts are deeply involved in actually finding solutions. You know, they're coming up with some pretty difficult um, solutions to tricky <coughs> business problems. So as those kind of roles sort of split out to needing to focus in their subject area, that's where the role of the product owner, the dedicated product owner kind of comes from. It sort of forms in the middle there where they sort of sync with the product manager on the roadmap and the business analyst and scrum events. Um, your mileage may vary, however. This is heavily dependent on the complexity of your product, the market you work in, your geographic um, sort of reach. Um, you know, it, it really depends on um, how big the roles are in your organization. Uh, I'll touch on just the role of the business analyst, where they sort of fit in with the product owner. Um, I'm not going to say that I've cracked this problem. These, this is just an example of how it works uh, at Orion that we've sort of come up with, is that the product owner is broad but shallow. I'm looking across my whole product, and the product owners who work for me are looking at, across the whole of their capability. But they're not going very deep. You know, they're responsible for how that um, the long-term roadmap for that um, capability or product. Um, but they've got quite a breadth of stuff to look at. And that leaves a gap because you want to deep dive on stuff. When you're building a, a complex technical thing, sometimes you really need to deep dive on a specific business problem. And that can be really hard for the product owner to do because you're pretty broad, you've got a lot to think about. And so that's where we use our, our business analysts that they deep dive on a particular issue. And so that's how we kind of interact with them. Um, I've seen this role called a product analyst being advertised, push payer uh, uh, advertising that. And that, that, that role, my understanding, is kind of a combination of both. And so, you know, that's blurring those lines between those two roles. So this is a model that worked for us. Your mileage may vary in your organization. And a bit of an anti-pattern, the product owner wearing too many hats. So product owner equals the random business guy. Yeah. Um,